<laughs> okay, so we're going. Great, so um, I'll move on from Angular Connect. Uh, what I do want you to know is that you've got to get this in your diary because October the 21st is Back to the Future Day. So it's a very important day in the, uh, in the calendar. So if you want to come to London during that time, that would be good fun. Okay, so uh, my name's Pete Bacon Darwin. Um, I'm the lead developer on the Angular One team. And for about the last year or so, well, I've been working on Angular for a few years now. Uh, but for the last year, uh, I've been fixing lots of bugs. Let's say that. I've been making quite a few as well. Um, but I've mostly fixed the ones that I've built. Um, so what I thought I would do is rather than tell you more about cool things in Angular, because I think I'm personally overloaded with all of the coolness that's coming out of uh, all these talks today, I was going to give you a little insight into some of the things that go on behind the scenes of Angular. Um, partially because it'll help me, because it'll make my life easier, but also because it'll help you guys. Uh, you can take some of these ideas um, and use them in your own projects. Uh, or if you've got problems with Angular, it will help you get your bugs solved more effectively. Um, but more importantly, I wanted to show you this new app I've been writing. Uh, it's taken me quite a while, and um, uh, I'm quite proud of it. Let's just show you the running version. Here we go. So quite often, when choosing, <laughs> now I'll show you my cat in a minute. Um, it's important to get the right cat. Okay, so you don't want to just get any old cat. So uh, it's quite good to be able to choose from a, a, a few well-defined parameters. So for instance, um, you might choose the color um, or maybe, maybe how fat it is. So, but this is, this is my particular favorite. Oh. That, that, if I actually had a cat, that would be my cat. It's very similar to the cat that my parents had when I was a child. Um, so uh, this is a very simple Angular app, as, as you can imagine. And uh, I was inspired by uh, John's talk this morning. So I've switched from using Sublime today to using uh, Visual uh, Code, uh, Visual Studio Code. So I haven't quite got the hang of all of the key things and everything. But it's pretty similar to Sublime. So hopefully I'll be OK. But the really nice thing about this one is that when you zoom in, it zooms in the left-hand side as well, whereas in Sublime, when you zoom in the code, the, you still can't see the, the um, navigator. So that was, one, that was the driving force. OK, so as you can see, uh, is it big enough? To, uh, should we go one more? Yeah. It would be really good if I knew the key code for hiding that um, left panel. Command B. Yay. OK, so we've basically got um, a very simple Angular app. I'm loading up Angular. I've got a few JS files that contain some stuff I'll show you in a minute. Um, but the interesting thing is that I'm repeating over a select. And the reason I'm doing this is that I'm actually using uh, dynamic data to define the selects that I'm going to uh, display. So if we look at um, my cat's file, you can see that the, the select that I was displaying is actually d uh, driven by data. Um, so you might be wanting to get this down from a website or from like a service or something. Um, and I'm going to then iterate over this and display my selects. And then as you, as you choose different categories, then it maps to these different images and so on and so on. And because I'm a really uh, good developer, I've even put some error handling in here. So uh, when we get an exception, it's going to dump it onto the screen. But as you can see, um, it's a perfectly working app. It works beautifully. And it's got no bugs in it at all. How do I get back to my? Here we go. Right, so um, I'm sure you're all aware. A few weeks ago, we uh, released Angular 1.4. It's fantastic. It's lots of uh, feature improvements. Uh, it's faster. Uh, it's more robust. So woo, let's upgrade. It turns out it's really easy to upgrade from 1.3 to 1.4, so I recommend it. What you do is you go to your index.html and you change that to that. You know, we've been talking a lot about migrating from Angular 1 to 2, yeah? And people have got a little bit of fear about this. But like, you know, this is my idea of migration, yeah? So we'll just save that. 
and we'll run the app and, uh, oh, no. What happened there? That's not right, is it? Okay, so um, Angular broke my app. And I'm really sorry. Um, this can happen. Sometimes it might be that, uh, that it's not our fault, but um, it probably is in this case. So in the old days, if you get to this situation, you've upgraded to a new, um, uh, a new version of some library, and it doesn't work, it's a closed source, proprietary uh, API, you've got n no access to the code at all, um, you're pretty stuffed. Yeah? What, you can send in some complaints to some support website and nothing will happen at all. Um, and uh, maybe you'll end up just rolling back and just waiting for the, for the next version if you're lucky. Um, but now we're in the open source world. It's the new age and everyone can get involved. And, uh, and we actively encourage that. Google, Angular, uh, to some extent Google, but Angular loves open source, yeah? Um, we've been running for five years now, and we've got 1,200 people who've, uh, different like, individuals who've committed to the Angular code base. This is just Angular 1 as well. Um, there's, there are other people who've not committed to Angular 1 who've committed to Angular 2. Um, and what I did was I, I stripped out all the people who've only done, like, documentation changes, because here, they don't count. 400 of those people actually provided significant code, so like either new features or proper bug fixes, obviously with unit tests. Um, and we've, we've actually handled and dealt with like 1,100, uh, sorry, 11,000 uh, issues and pull requests, yeah? So it's been a it's been pretty full-on engagement with the, uh, with the community out there. Um, the reason this disclaimer is in here is I was showing this uh, talk to someone and they were saying, uh, yeah, but it just sounds like you're trying to get people to come and work on Angular for free. Um, and that's not really very helpful. It just, it's just a bit egotistic. So the reason I'm putting this disclaimer in is like, anyone who has a GitHub account probably interacts with open source uh, software. And many of the issues that we're go I'm going to talk about today will come up with any interaction, whether you're on the usage side like using an open source project, or whether you're on the production side where you're actually developing a soft, uh, some software. And this even happens internally in a private project, yeah? You've got clients that are using your, your library internally in your, in your company. And the way that you interact across this boundary between the users and the developers, um, by users I'm talking like developer users, um, like the people who write with the library that you develop, um, are all going to benefit from these ideas, hopefully. So when you're listening to what I'm talking about, I'm just using Angular as an example here, yeah? I could be at um, a React conference talking about uh, Ember. Yeah, who knows, right. So um, Angular broke my app. So I'm gonna report the bug like a diligent developer would. And uh, I don't know if you can read this, but it basically just says, look, I updated to Angular 1.4 and I'm getting errors. Please help me, I need to go live tomorrow. Um, this is a not actionable issue, non-actionable. And um, a few uh, months ago, I, I'm sure I heard Mishko declaring that non-actionable issues should just be closed. Yeah, because there's nothing we can do about them. And uh, otherwise, we're going to end up with uh, um, issue bankruptcy, where you just have this flood of issues that you can't do anything about, and there's not enough people to um, deal with them. So um, this is such a bad issue. You'll notice that I actually even posted it to the wrong project. <laughs> and that was an honest mistake. I actually meant to post it to AngularJS, but I posted it to the Angular 2 app. Um, and then I got my wrist slapped, so I closed it. So there is a better way. And um, because Angular has been doing open source for a while, and we've had lots of issues, and we've had lots of pull requests, we've evolved various guidelines and um, ideas on how uh, best to actually contribute, both in terms of reporting issues, but actually contributing code as well. There's a long, long document here that we've set out lots of the field uh, ideas that we think are important when you're trying to do this sort of stuff. And really, my talk today is pretty much a condensation of this document. So please go ahead and read this in, in the background while I'm talking. And then you don't have to listen to me talk, because you get all the info anyway. 
So to, to boil it down, there are six golden steps that I think are important uh, in terms of getting uh, contributing to a, a project, whether it's open source or whether it's internal or whatever. So first of all, when we get a bug, we need to actually think about why has this happened. Um, we can't just sort of wave our hands in the air and, and shout swear words at the people who provided the, um, the, the library. Uh, if you've worked out it really is a bug, we need to post an issue, and it has to be a, an actionable issue, yeah? And then we try and fix the problem if we're feeling keen, and then we might even com contribute it, or we maybe we'll just go and fork our own library and keep it to ourselves, uh, and then eventually we get to bask in glory. So let's just go through those steps uh, in a little bit more detail. For me, this is one of the most important things, that, messages I want to get out of today from the point of view of the Angular project, because this is the thing that will make uh, the Angular's process, development process, more efficient by you know, factors of 10. If you can provide this kind of information, you know, how do we actually reproduce like, the, the bug in simple terms? How do you, can you strip out? There's no good like, posting your entire like, 10,000, 100,000 line app and saying it's broken. Yeah, strip out everything else and find exactly the, the, the key point where it breaks. Um, hold on, yeah. And then once you've kind of worked that out, then we post an issue. Um, and if you can provide a running example, this is glory. You know, when I get to an issue and I look at it and there's like a plunker and I, just, I can just click on it and immediately I can see what's going on, I can start playing with it, I can try and deduce what the problem is. You get even more bonus points if you can create a failing unit test. Because um, that's pretty much like three quarters of the job done, yeah? Here's um, an awesome example, which happens to be the example which uh, is the bug that I just demonstrated. So let's have a look at uh, what Ryan did. He wrote this essay, and it really is beautiful. And if I got all my issues like this, it would just be fantastic. Um, someone also uh, fed back to me that I shouldn't show issues like this because it would put people off writing them. Because they'd be like, but I'm never going to write something like this. And, um, but to be honest, I would rather show this and, and like have a goal to aim for. And then maybe, uh, maybe if you don't quite write as many words as this, it's not a big deal. But he captures a lot of the really important things. You know, he gives me an overview. He's um, explained why he's using it in such a way. Because sometimes, you know, you you've got some really esoteric bug, and if you don't understand the reason why you're using the software in that way, it's hard to, to decide whether it's really a bug or not. Uh, he explains which versions of Angular it works, fails on, which browsers he's using. He's provided me with a plunker, yay. And look at that, he's even suggested a fix, which is awesome. And look, Pavel agrees. Wow, I love pug reports like this one. Uh, Hokios uh, did, did so too. Anyway, so this is a really good, really good one. There are other examples out there. Um, they kind of tend to look a bit similar, yeah? Overview of the issue, motivation. Maybe uh, they're copying each other. The versions, how to reproduce it. Suggested fix, look at this, it's fantastic. So you can go out there and, and, and crib off other people, and uh, I think that's a good way to get started. But we can always go the extra mile. You know, it's one thing to provide a bug report, but you, Really, what we want to do is, um, is try and fix it. So if you're going to try and fix a bug, you need to set up your environment so that you can actually develop against the project. And every project out there has wrinkles and weird tools that they want to use. You know, and if you start getting into Angular 2, you've got a whole new chain of uh, tool set uh, that you're going to have to get used to. So. Um, one of the biggest hurdles, I think, for people who are starting out trying to contribute to a system is how do, you, how do you set up your environment? So first of all, you fork the repository. Um, and then you clone it down to your uh, local host. Uh, in the case of Angular, we need to install some tools. Uh, in particular, for Angular 1, we use Grunt as, a, as, a, uh, as the build tool. In Angular 2, we're using Gulp. Uh, then the most important thing is you need to check out your own branch and do your work from your own branch because Git loves branches. They're cheap. They're easy. You can throw them away. You can merge them. It's great. And this is the, this is the, the best way of working because then also when you create a pull request, GitHub understands this, and as you push more things to the branch, it updates the, 
the pull request well. And then at the bottom, we've got two very Angular specific things here, which is um, grunt package. And what that does is it builds the Angular, tool, uh, Angular files, it minifies them, it generates all the docs, uh, does some stuff to do with error processing. Um, and then this grunt auto test. And grunt auto test is just a wrapper for Karma. Yeah? So what it does is it kicks off a Karma um, test runner, and it just sits there watching all your files, and whenever you change one of them, it will run all the unit tests again. So you get a really good feedback. So I'm just going to quickly do that. Um, I've already branched. I've created a branch called 1.4.0 minus dev. And then uh, and I just ran package. And this is basically what it looks like. It does loads of sort of stuff to do with minifying and uh, generating the, the docs. It takes a little while, so I thought I wouldn't bother running it again now. And now if I hit grunt auto test, we're just going to be running all the unit tests. Now there's a slight wrinkle with Chrome at the moment that if it's not in view, then it goes into sort of a sleep mode, yeah? So unfortunately, I'm not quite sure how this is going to work with this presentation, because as soon as I switch away, it'll stop running. Okay, so you can see it's running through. They're all succeeding. And now the next important step from Angular's point of view, and I would say from any project's point of view, whenever you get a bug, the first thing you should do is write a test that will uh, exercise that bug, will actually demonstrate that bug. This is a beautiful idea. And I don't think lots of people do this because they, they see the bug and they go, ah, and they fix it, and they're like, wow, fixed it, brilliant, move on. But then, do you really know you fixed it? Have you fixed it for all the possible reasons that it could have happened? Um, in the future, someone might change the code and, and cause the bug to regress and happen again. So if you go and create a unit test which will um, actually fail, and then you fix the bug and you show the unit <coughs> test is passing, you've not only um, demonstrated concretely that you fixed it, but also you um, have a safety net for the future so that it cannot happen again. You know, that bug cannot reappear. And often people who would like to do unit testing but just don't like this idea of writing loads and loads of unit tests, uh, if you start this way and every time you have a bug and you write a unit test, then over time you build up this armory of unit tests anyway. So it's kind of like not test-driven development, it's kind of test-driven bug fixing or something. Um, so we're going to just quickly rate, create this test. If I can work out how to do it. So inside here, I've got some snippets. Here's my unit test. And then I need to switch into my Angular. Now, the other thing that's interesting, I think, is how a project is laid out. Yeah, because often people come and look at a file system of a project, and it's really hard to ascertain where everything is. Um, in Angular, we've got loads of top-level folders, which are somewhat confusing, like internationalization. What does that mean? Don't worry about any of that. Lib doesn't really mean what you think it might mean. Scripts means more like what lib means. Um, but the two, files, uh, two folders you should care about are source and test, yeah? All our unit tests and end-to-end -end te oh, no, almost all our end-to-end -end tests live in here. Um, and then each, within test and also within source, we have every module is uh, uh, the next folder down, okay? So we're going to go into the test folder, find our ng options directive, and go somewhere down here-ish. Why don't we put it there? Now if I hit save, hopefully, what you'll see is that it's triggered the automatic uh, testing to rerun the unit test, and immediately we've got an error. So my, my test is actually demonstrating the problem. So let's just quickly look at that test. The IIT at the top uh, just says, only run this test, yeah? You know this. If you're using Jasmine 2, it's FIT. It's really annoying. I don't know why they didn't just follow our lead. Because Gene, uh, uh, Voita Gina basically came up with IIT and D describe, and, and it worked really well. And then Jasmine decided to use F 
instead. So we've got F describe and FIT. I guess it means force. Focus. Focused. Focused. Okay. I like IIT. It's nicer. It's less likely to occur, so I can search for IIT. If I search for FIT, it could occur all over the place, couldn't it? Um, so the key point is that um, I'm creating this. I'm using a helper that we built to create the select. And what you can see is that um, I've actually, so what I really should have done is actually debugged into the app. And when I ran this talk before, it was only 25 minutes long, so I didn't debug into it. But now we've got 55 minutes, so I think we should actually have a quick look at what actually is happening. So whenever you've got a problem, our Chrome console is always there to help. And in fact, if I set to catch exceptions, refresh, we jump over the first exception, which hope we're hoping to get rid of in Angular 1.5, which is that we're not loading a locale. <laughs> OK. You know where you are anyway. We're at Angular U. It's OK. <clears throat> And, uh, the first, and then the next exception occurs here. And this is inside my function, so this is interesting. Um, and what it seems is that my value.name is undefined. So I'm trying to recall, uh, I'm trying to call replace on an undefined object. But that's weird because if you look at my um, data, cat images, well, there it is. Um, Oh, no, not cat images, cat types, because we're iterating over cat types. Come on. Let's watch that. Cat types is not available. Uh, OK. Let's look at it in here. So all the objects in cat types have got a name. So why am I getting an undefined? So it turns out that if we look at the um, call stack, you can see here's my get label being called. And then if I go up a, a functional, so I, get, I end up in this get watchable method. It's really hard to see. It's kind of a, a fight trade-off between making it big enough to see and fitting it on the screen. Can you see that? So basically, um, we create this. Uh, we've got this method called get watchables up here. And what happens is uh, the way that we update ng options is that we um, every turn of the digest loop we create this object. Called, well, this array called watchables array, which is all the things that could possibly change that would affect us rendering ng options. And if any of them change, then we have to re-render the ng options directive. And so we collect up all of these things and then if, and check if they've changed from the last time. And one of the things that we do is we, uh, we call the display function, which is the thing that will be the label, the string of the label. But it turns out that um, if you look at the values here, We've got these two objects which we expect, which is fat and thin. But then we've got this other object, or this other property called hash key object two. And, it turn, and when you're iterating over something with ng repeat, we um, attach a hash key to it so that we can identify it. And the, the bug basically turns out that um, in our get watchables, we're iterating over all of the keys of, object, of the values object including this dollar dollar hash key property which we really aren't interested in. And if you look in here, his suggested fix is indeed saying exactly that, that, um, that we're iterating over the keys here. So it made my life really easy because I immediately was able to track down the problem. 
So in my test, I've created an object, an array, but I've attached a few naughty little properties to it that I don't really want to iterate over. Now, it turns out that when we're actually iterating over the actual options, we do ignore these things. It's just that when we were iterating over it in terms of watching it, we weren't ignoring it. So I need to, to check that, um, that we did not get anything that said do not watch. The solution is glorious. It's a one-liner. Yeah, we, I love it when this kind of thing happens. All we just do is uh, when, we're iter when we're iterating over these object keys, if it starts with a dollar, we ignore it. Um, and that seemed like a good idea at the time. But then when I was on the plane on the way over here, it suddenly occurred to me that actually if it's an array, I don't want to iterate over anything that's not numeric. So this is not a good enough solution. This is the solution we've merged. But if any of you guys want to come up with a better solution, then, uh, then you get to be a contributor to AngularJS. Um, what you'll find in the code is, if we go to where ng options is, And we search for get watchables. Here it is. A bit further down, we've got this other method called get options. Now, get options does something very similar to get watchables. That actually gets the options that we're going to iterate over and, and display. Um, and what you'll notice here is that they do this funky thing here, which says if the object that we're iterating over is an array, then just iterate over it as an array rather than iterating over it as a bunch of properties on an object. So the real solution, if you want to submit a PR, is to factor out that bit of code, because we don't want to repeat ourselves, because that wouldn't be dry. Factor out that bit of code and reuse it in both the get watchables and in the um, get options method. But in the meantime, this was the solution we came up with. And it works as long as you're for the dollar dollar hash, yeah? But if for some reason you had an array that you attached some other property to, it would break. And I can prove that because if I, can I get that bit? Oh, I'll just type it in. If I go and try and fix this now by doing if key dot char at zero equals dollar, Return. Does that look right? I'm no good at live coding. It still failed. You couldn't see it because it happened too quickly. And the reason is, is that in our um, spec, I put in this these two additional naughty properties that don't start with a dollar. If I comment those out briefly, then we get success. A nice green, green light down here. So this is why we need to actually go and fix this in a better way. So I'm leaving that as an exercise for the person in the room. And I wonder if someone on the live stream can actually get a pull request in before the end of the, uh, before the end of the talk. So then, once you've uh, once you test, once you've got this up and running, uh, you need to actually test it in your real app. Let's check that it, it actually fixes it. So you can use grunt build, which is another proprietary Angular command, which generates um, the, the uh, angular.js file. So let's just do that. It takes a little while because it always tries to go to NPM to, and, uh, and a CDN to check if you need to update things first. Right, and then we're going to copy um, build angular.js to my nifty shards of code, lib, angular, let's call it um, fixed, js. OK. And we're going to see if this works. Cross your fingers. So we jump over the first error because that's a good error. 
and now we're working again. So we've managed to fix the bug for our purposes, but not for the purposes of someone who might put another property on which doesn't start with a dollar. But that's okay because development is an iterative process. You know, we fix a little bit and then we'll come back and fix a little bit more later, yeah? If we always wait until there's no bugs in the project, you'll never ever release it, I'm sorry to say. That sounds really um, unprofessional, doesn't it? But the fact is that there are always bugs in code. It's impossible to write code which doesn't have any bugs in. The important thing is that you fix bugs faster than they appear, if you can. Finally, we've got this other thing in Angular called grunt test, and that does a whole load of stuff. It checks all of your code with JS hint to make sure that it's not doing anything that uh, Mr. Cropford wouldn't like. Um, it uses JSCS, which checks that the, the styling of your code is good, so that checks that you know, we don't like to have braces at the wrong place or spaces after um, curly braces and so on. Uh, package, it, we've already seen. Uh, the test unit is basically a one-off run of what we were doing with Grunt Auto Test. And then we've got a few other test things, and the most important one, which, uh, which takes forever, is called Test Protractor, and we run through about 200 end-to-end -end tests using that. I'm not going to run that. Well, I could start running it now, but um, it probably won't be finished by the time we finish the talk. But I can leave it running for fun in the background. So we've, we've found the problem, we submitted an issue, we've solved the problem, we've built a failing unit test, we've put some code in that completely fixes it, now we need to submit this so that we can uh, help the rest of the world who might come across this problem. So this hits another area that Angular has been pushing hard on, and I think people generally starting to sign up to this idea now. And when I first came across it, I'd never come across this idea before in Git. But the idea is that if you style your commit messages in a very special way, we can, it gives you a bunch of uh, useful things. First of all, um, when you're reading the commits, it's very easy to parse them mentally. So when you can quickly see, okay, this is a fix for ng options, quick high level idea. Um, oh, and look, it closes some PR, so I can go and see which PR was related to it and very quickly identify, um, or an issue in this case, um, where that originally came from. Um, but more importantly, from a project point of view, we can machine parse this and generate our change log from it. So if you ever go to um, the, uh, get the, the AngularJS change log, let's uh, do it this way. Come on, internet. Yay, yeah, still working. <laughs> This big file here is totally automated, yeah? This is not handwritten at all. Each line is, is taken from a commit, and we're able to extract out that information because our commit messages are always formed in a, in a good way. And the tool that's used to do this um, is a handcrafted tool inside Angular, but Andy Joslin and, and other people have written a nice uh, NPM tool that you can use called conventional changelog, and there's a grunt plugin for that. Uh, which you can use. And so you can just run it and it'll dump out this nice markdown file containing your changelog from the previous release. Um, if you want to know about the detail of our commit message conventions, we've got a document on this as well. Uh, this was written some time back. Uh, it'll take too long to load. So go and have a look at that when you've uh, got a moment. Um, and then finally, we create the pull request. Um, the one thing I wanted to say about pull requests is that um, when, if you want to then make changes to the pull request, personally, I like not to fiddle around with the commits that were already there, but just layer new commits on top. Um, in Angular, whenever we uh, merge a commit, we always squash it down and rebase on top of master so we don't have any merge commits inside Angular at all. We've got this one single thread of history. Um, which helps us with, um, with our changelog processes. But also, um, I personally find it much more easy to grok. Like when I look at some of the projects where you've just got this m massive intermingling of different branches that have been merged, I find it very hard to see exactly where things have come from. Um, but when you're writing a pull request, if you just add commits on, 
then it's very easy to go back to that pull request in the, in the future and see how that pull request evolved over time. So you'll put in your initial idea, and then someone come back and say, in this case, Jorge asked, was saying, do we really want to ignore things that are only dollar, not dollar dollar? Um, in fact, in the end, I've now come to the decision that we should go the other way and ignore everything that's, that's uh, not a number, in an array at least. And then in an object, we should only ignore uh, things with a dollar in the front. So we had a little discussion, and we decided we didn't need to change it. But if I had needed to change it, I would have just put another commit in on top. And then we could go back to this pull request and see the discussion that happened and how we changed the, uh, the, the way that the pull request was going to work out. Um, and then when you finally merge it, it all gets crossed down into a single commit anyway. But what I do when I merge those, I then put a closes which references the pull request. So if you go to the, um, to the actual commit that closes this pull request down here, you can see it's got two closes in. It's a single commit for the whole pull request. The first closes is for the issue. The second closes is for the pull request. So we've got this nice linkage back. So in the future, when someone comes along and says, well, why the hell didn't you get rid of all of the string properties as well as the things starting with dollar, we can go to this commit using blame. And then from this commit, we can then go to the pull request and then see the discussions that went on. In this case, it's a pretty simple bug, yeah? So it's easy to see. But you know, we've got bugs where maybe five or six issues were created, and there was a lot of discussion about the right way of dealing with it, and maybe we didn't even agree in the end on which there's the right way. And so you might end up having to go back and readdress those. And finally, you can sit back and enjoy the fact that your contribution has been merged to the community and that you've uh, made Angular even better than it was before. Um, and if you're feeling like having bonus points, you can then keep an eye and see if uh, someone else comes up with an even more uh, stringent unit test that fails your, your fix, such as an array that has strings on that don't have dollars at the front. Um, so basically, that's all I had to say. Um, I've done 40 minutes, so I'm, I'm well under. Um, we can do a, a bunch of different things now. We could either go and watch one of the other talks, <laughs> or we can have a little bit of Q&A. We can uh, hand code the correct fix for this, uh, for this bug. Um, so it's up to you. What do you want to do? Everyone gets up and leaves. No, I'm joking. Yeah, should we, should we make the whole thing in Angular 2? Yeah. <laughs> You're going to help me with that, Patrick. Um, I don't know if it's like, there's some problems with like, Yeah. There's some problems with the Well, that, that Kurt fluffy one was basically the, the cat that I would like to have. I don't have a cat. We've got fish. Okay, yeah, let's do some questions.